Here is a good book. There you go. Enjoy this good book. And everyone's like, no, no, it's dreadful, it's awful, it's terrible for X, Y, Z, violence, abuse, blah, blah, blah. But it's still a good book. Chill out. Chill out. It's just a good book. <laughs> it's pissing me off. <laughs> Lapvona is awesome. This is my first Otessa Moshveg book, and it will not be my last. I cannot wait to get my hands on my year of rest and relaxation. This is exactly my kind of book. What's curious about it, though, is that it has had such a mixed response from critics and readers alike. And I don't want to sound edgy, but I don't understand why. Lapvona is a medieval, fantasy-inspired novel about a small world, a small village called Lapvona, where the poor toil away in servitude to a man on a hill who lords over everybody else. It is a cruel and unjust and unequal society. It very much reflects the world that we're living in right now, the world that we've been living in for so, so long, but it seems like more and more people are talking about injustice right now, and that's wonderful, and so is Otessa Moshveg with Lapvona. It is a frightening book, in the sense that there's a lot of body horror in it, and scary imagery and scary events. There are really traumatizing things in it, most prominently some truly horrifying sexual abuse. But I've read and loved so many great books, always by women, that have contained these elements and have gone on to become favorites of mine. Most prominently, the novels of Sayaka Murata and Melissa Broda, two of my favorite authors. And this joins the ranks. It seems like anything that is shocking, anything that is poking very, very hard at things like patriarchy, and unjust societies, and does so through body horror and shocking events and abuse, is something that's going to just ring true for me and grab me in just the right ways. But this book has had so many people clutching their pearls, up in arms about how dreadful the content is, and how upsetting it all is, and how Otessa Moshveg must hate people and hate society and is so cruel and angry. Yeah? So? Yes, okay. Fine. Great. It makes for a wonderful book. As for what it's actually about, this novel is separated into four acts following the four seasons, spring, summer, autumn, winter, and then a tiny bit of spring at the end again. They're not equal in size, summer is the largest, and in this book you've got a small community in some sort of medieval era, it's not clear where or when it is, it is somewhere in Europe, somewhere during a medieval period. There is plague, there is drought, there is inequality and cruelty, there is a lack of care and love in this world. It is brutal and unkind. And we have a very small cast of characters that makes it feel quite gothic. You could make a case for this being a gothic novel. It's certainly sprinkled with fantastical elements because there are moments in here that are impossible. For example, a woman switches her eyes out for the eyes of a horse so that she can see again. Things like this are fantastical, but they're not that frequent. It's more gothic than anything, because you have a small cast of very, very unlikable people. You even have a big house on a hill in a very gothic setting, and a small village at the base of it, so it's a very closed and claustrophobic community where they don't trust outsiders, and they make a lot of comments about the people in the north, the people in the south, the way that trade works, and again, injustice in terms of trade imbalance and what people get for the things that they do. It's a very socialist book, it's a very gothic book, and it's sprinkled with fantasy, as I said. If we do have a protagonist, it is the boy Marek. When we begin the novel, Marek lives with his father. Marek is about 12, 13 years old, his father Jude is a cruel and unloving man, and Marek was raised without a mother. He is told by Jude that his mother died in childbirth. He points to the hearth in their cottage and says that she died giving birth right there and you can still see her blood on the stone. It's a very visceral image, and it lets you know what kind of imagery you're going to see throughout the book. Marek is also very disfigured. He has a crooked spine and an arm that doesn't work very well. He's repeatedly called ugly. 
And there's a lot that his father knows that he doesn't know. While Merrick, I guess, is our sympathetic character, and therefore our main character, he's not the only one. You get a lot of chapters from Jude's perspective. In fact, there are technically only four chapters, but there are many, many sub-chapters, and every time there's a sub-chapter break, we switch perspectives to someone else. We'll go from Merrick to Jude to Villiam, the man who lords over everyone else, the lord of this fiefdom. We learn very early on the truth about Merrick's mother, who she was, what she was. The fact that she didn't, in fact, die in childbirth. The fact that when Jude met her, she'd had her tongue cut out, and he never heard her speak. I won't tell you much more, but there's a lot of mystery within this novel that gets explored, and things twist and turn constantly. But none of it is delivered in a way that feels like a heavy hit, or anything that is supposed to be shocking, anything that's supposed to be delivered with a lot of emotional weight. There's a sense of distance between you and the characters and events of this story. It almost feels like a farce. It almost feels sometimes like a stage comedy. Something that you're supposed to just kind of sit back and admire. You don't have that much emotional attachment to the characters and events. I think that's why I don't understand the backlash that this book has had from some people. Not all. Some critics have, just like me, said that it's a masterpiece. But for the people that have fought back against this book and clutched their pearls and gotten upset by it, it seems like they've invested too much feeling into it, because I feel like it's not meant to. There's a sense of keeping everything at arm's length here. You don't really feel that attached to anyone, and no one is likable. This is another book by another wonderful modern female author full of unlikable, horrible people, just like a Melissa Broder book. I cherish these authors and their books. But the way that events unfold and twists are thrown at you makes you feel like you don't need to care about them that much. I really enjoy that distance. I really felt like I was watching a play that I wasn't that invested in and just enjoying what was happening in a almost guilty, voyeuristic kind of a way. And that's all down to the language and the delivery. Everything is written in a very matter-of-fact way. This is not a difficult, heavy, dense book. Some literary fiction is incredibly dense in the way that it's written, experimental language. None of that is here. This is a super straightforward, quick to read, easy to digest novel. The writing is short and punchy and nicely paced and simplistic, and I absolutely love that. But again, it, it offers this sense of detachment from it, which the fact that it's so easy to read makes you feel like you're cheating in some way. Now, I will give away one event that happens early on. I said that Merrick is our sympathetic point of view character in a sense, but within the first quarter of the book, within the spring section, he meets the son of Villiam the Lord, Jacob. Jacob is nothing like his father. Villiam, very interestingly, is depicted as a weak and pathetic man. He lords over everyone, and he enjoys the spoils of their labour. He does cruel and horrible things to the people, like diverting their water supply, and when there's a drought, you see him feasting on animals of the forest. He is a cruel and awful lord, but he's also a very pathetic, cowardly, weaselly, kind of camp man. There's nothing masculine or manly or brutish about him. He's flagrant and kind of pathetic and, and weaselly. In a way, he kind of reminds me of Mr. Fishoder from Bob's Burgers. That's pretty much what he is. In so many ways, actually. In the sense that he's very, very funny, he's a comedic character in a way. He's foppish and dumb and yet so rich and so powerful. But his son, Jacob, is this young hunter type. He reminds me of, if you've ever read any Batman comics, Damian Wayne, Batman's son. He kind of reminds me of him a lot. But early on, Merrick and Jacob meet each other, and Merrick lures Jacob up to the top of a mountain and kills him. He throws a rock at him, Jacob falls off, lands on a rock lower down, and bleeds out, and you see a halo of blood around him. It's horrible. We barely spend any time with Jacob, Merrick just kills him. And then, he confesses to Jude what he did, and Jude hits him and abuses him, and then takes him to Villiam to confess to Jacob's father, the lord of the land, what he did. And William just goes, okay, I'll keep your son. You can take my son's dead body, take his corpse away, keep it, do whatever you want with it. I'm going to take your son and raise him as my son, because I don't have one anymore, so I want yours, the one that killed mine. There we go, job done, brilliant, give me a son. 
And so he does. Jude goes, great. Uh, he was never my son anyway, really. I don't give a shit about him. Off you go. And then, for the rest of the novel, Merrick lives with William and is raised in his castle on the hill, lording over everybody else. But they don't get along, and I won't tell you any more. So this is a book of cruelty and aggression. As I said, there's a lot of sexual abuse. There is creepy breastfeeding. There is a woman in this novel who is the village witch, the soothsayer, the medicine woman, and she acted as wet nurse for every person in the village. She breastfed everybody. When she was entering into kind of her old age, she started leaking milk and just started breastfeeding everybody. It's, it's horrible. And yet everyone treats her like a witch, like an outsider, like a monster, someone to be feared. There are a lot of deep, dense themes in here. For one, you've got Ina, that's the witch woman. She kind of represents something that is to nurture and yet be hated. In a way, she represents all of womanhood. The idea that women give birth, raise children, breastfeed, nurture, soothe. Women look after their husbands, they look after their sons, and yet they are abused and given so few rights and so little control and we have so much gender inequality all across the world even today. Ina represents all of that. She's a woman who physically nurtures everybody and yet is hated and distrusted and abused. And she's old, she's so old, and yet she's continued to nurture and support the world around her and gotten nothing in return. But she also really is a witch who's able to do incredible magical things. And then you've got the very, very obviously socialist themes of class inequality and the fact that William is doing terrible things to the people beneath him, and he believes that he's entitled to do it because of good breeding, and that's it. He was born into it, and that's how it works. So the socialist themes here are very, very on the nose. They are almost, in a sense, delivered to you as if you'd never considered class inequality in your entire life. You are a baby socialist, a person who is apolitical, and Otessa Moschweg is just throwing this at you and going, hey look, we have class inequality. The elite suck the working class dry. She is presenting us a kind of communist manifesto in a sense that is very, very simplistic and easy to digest and very on the nose in terms of the characters and themes of the book. Thematically, everything is on the nose here. As I said, Ina representing womanhood. She might even represent Mother Earth, the fact that she is nurturing us and we are literally sucking her dry. We are burning her, we are destroying her, and yet she is our mother. She is everything that we have. She is all that we have. She is beautiful and wonderful and kind to us. And look at how we've repaid her. That's what Ina represents. Motherhood in the sense of Mother Earth and also womanhood, and the way that society treats women and Earth. These things overlap beautifully, and Ina represents both of them. So thematically, this is a very simple book. There's a lot of aggression and anger. Otessa Moschweg is furious at the world, and she's expressing that through violence and aggression and scary imagery, body horror, really, really gross, horrible stuff. Sexual abuse, physical abuse, death, murder. It's awful, and it's wonderful. And the fact that, as I said, it's written in this arm's length kind of a way makes you feel like it's easier to appreciate the themes because you're not too deep in it. You're not lost in the forest of this novel, feeling suffocated by it. You're watching it from a distance and you're able to think clearly about what these themes are, what they mean, what they represent to us. As you watch it, you are detached from it and you're going, why that? What does this mean? I'm able to think clearly because I'm removed from it, in a sense. Rather than feeling like you're deep into the novel and being suffocated and confused and frightened and disorientated by it, that doesn't happen with Lapvona. You feel far enough away from the action that you can see it clearly, you can see the wood for the trees. I have loved this book to bits. I have loved it thematically. I have loved the fact that there are no characters to root for. They're all awful. I've loved the gritty, nasty, horrible events. I've loved the way that it shocks and upsets and frightens people. I enjoy that. You can call me an edgelord. I'll have to make my peace with that. I really, really respect what Otessa Moschweg is doing here thematically and with just having fun as well, as weird as that sounds. I'm very upset by all of the pearl clutching and people turning away from this novel and going, oh, oh, oh it's so horrible. So what? So what? What, what is the... <laughs> 
What is the big deal? What is the big deal with the murder and the aggression and the violence in it? Maybe I've watched too many horror films or played too many violent video games. I just don't understand why people are so upset by this. It's baffling to me. It's just a good book. Like, it's just good. Like, I tweeted about this when I was only 100 pages in. I was like, this is just a good book? I don't understand. Everyone's like, oh, I don't like it. I don't like it for X, Y, Z. Oh, it's too much, blah, blah. It's just, like, a good book. It's, it's just good. Like, here is a good book. There you go. Enjoy this good book. And everyone's like, no, no, it's dreadful. It's awful. It's terrible for X, Y, Z. Violence, abuse, blah, blah, blah. But it's still a good book. Chill out. Chill out. It's just a good book. <laughs> it's pissing me off. Oh, God. Here's a good book. Read this really good fucking book. Lapvona's great. Lapvona's awesome. Just read it and enjoy it. It's clever. It's smart. It's funny. It's weird. It's wonderful. Read Lapvona and subscribe for books.